Okay, what are your hobbies? Do you like to play sports? What types of activities do you like to do? Uh, my hobbies would definitely include playing guitar uh, and being a typical boy and playing Xbox. <laughs> but also, uh, I, I, I try to like go outside of my uh, comfort zone, I try to make hobbies, a socialization, like socializing with everyone. And also, uh, I guess I would say uh, I'm a, a friendly type of guy, so I always hang out with my friends. <laughs> Can you hear better? Can you hear better? Okay, great. I'm very active. I do tennis and then varsity tennis, and I run track. I do. I'm on the Palm Squad, and I'm on USTA tennis team, so that's fun. Great. You guys are doing a great job so far. Can you tell us about your hearing loss? What type of hearing loss you have? To be honest, I couldn't even tell you after 19 years. But uh, all I know is uh, I have uh, moderate to severe hearing loss in my left ear. Um, I lost all my hearing in my right ear and I have a cochlear implant. Um, what else? What else was it? How do you communicate at home? Uh, how do I communicate at home? Just by talking. But uh, occasionally I'll get the harassment every now and then with the sign language. <laughs> but, eh, but that's all. I was born deaf. How do you communicate at home? Where do you go to school, and how do you communicate at school? Uh, right now I'm attending uh, Moraine Valley Community College. Um, I mean, not too bad. Um, I also I, uh, get around school just by talking to everyone, and also uh, I have a, uh, like a system if I need to communicate with my teachers, and I'll go through the school if I need anything extra, and that's about it. Do you read your teacher's lips and hear enough to be able to understand? Uh, yes, I also do that. And also I have a uh, text to uh, a talk to text system. Uh, I can't think of the name at the top of my head, but the, uh, the people I go through is called ACS captions or something. Mm -hmm. Very good and dependent. So I would look into that. Um, and that's usually how I go to class every day. So pretty straightforward. I'm a sophomore at Rochester High School and I communicate by just talking. And you can understand your teachers? Yes. Okay. I go to Rochester Intermediate, Intermediate School um, and I'm in fourth grade. And I communicate the same way as Elvis by talking. Do you remember when you had your cochlear implant surgery? Yes, I do. How old were you, and can you tell us about um, it? That would be freshman year of high school, so that 15 or 14, I don't know how. But uh, what was the other part? How do I remember? Yeah, tell us about it. Uh, I like to describe it as I felt like I was listening to Minnie Mouse 24-7 when I first got it activated. It got somewhat annoying, but you know, baby steps, as they say. But uh, over time, this became normal. I accepted the way it was, so I liked it a lot. Was it your decision to have the implant? Oh, most certainly it was. Yeah, of course I had some uh, some influence of the wiser ones, also known as my parents. <laughs> Should I ask who the wiser ones were? <laughs> oh, my parents for sure. They're sitting in the bag. Yeah, the one who's in denial with the Did you see his mother look back as well? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's about it. I was born deaf, so I got my first cochlear implant when I was 18 months, and I was the second youngest child in the United States to get it done. And then when I was eight years old, I got it 
I was at first mother and daughter team with my mom to get it done. So Yeah. Tell me I have it next to you. Oh yeah, and my mom has bilateral cochlear implants too. And she lost her hearing like over time she was pregnant with me and then I was born deaf. And tell me again when the second implant was done? It was at eight years old. Eight years old. Do you remember that surgery? Yeah, I do. Tell us about it. It was, I mean, I don't remember, like, a whole bunch, but I do remember it. What do you remember, the surgery? Yeah, I do. It was, it was life-changing. And what about the activation? The what? When it was turned on? Um, it was, it didn't turn on, like, right away. It took a long time to get my brain used to it. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, but I, I got a new cochlear implant. What is it called? The, uh, I think is how you, and mm -hmm. that's been a, a big difference um, that we've seen. She got the second implant when she was eight, and it really was never fully adopted. Um, for I mean, she wore it, but really didn't hear much with it. And so when they came up with the new processors, I got uh, two new processors, and so I asked her, insurance wouldn't cover it, but I said, if you want to try it just to see, and she said yes. So we paid for her to get um, the processor on the side that she's not fully adopted, and she's only had that for about maybe two or three, well, since December, and it's made a huge difference, not necessarily in understanding voices, but localization to sound. We see that she's much more aware. She gets her driver's license at the end of this month, and so that is probably <laughs> been our biggest concern, was that she would be able to at least hear noises, you know, if a horn was honking or that sort of thing. So, yeah. Thanks. Well, I had my co-current plan surgery and I was one, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm Caleb's mom, and he was 16 months and 22 months when he got uh, both of his implants. Um, so he doesn't remember anything about the surgeries or activation or anything. He's seen pictures and, and videos, but um, we are pretty much status out on our mappings and going to St. Louis um, Children's Hospital for all of that, but he's used to making all those trips and going for all those appointments and going to the sound booth and doing all those fun little games to make the adjustments better. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jessica. I'm from Kansas City. Um, I got my How do you feel about all of the trips to speech therapy and services after the implant? Frustrating, that's for sure. I would, I would, I would say I'm a lazy guy. If it, uh, if it doesn't come naturally, if it comes naturally, I can say I can be pretty lazy and don't work at it. But uh, I enjoyed actually going to speech therapy, even though I told my parents I hated it, but I actually, <laughs> I actually enjoyed it. Uh, it's just, it's just like learning any sort of new sport. You just got to do all the muscle memories, the rotations, right, and make sure you're actually hearing everything the way it's supposed to be. So it's just repetition. It's the main way. I liked it. Do you think that years later you'll actually go back and thank your speech therapist? I should probably go back and thank her now, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Remember that one. <laughs> How do you feel about all the trips to speech therapy? It's a lot, but I've been going since I was born, so kind of used to it. <laughs> Time to thank your speech therapist? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I do. The first time I went um, to the place, sorry, um, is, well, I felt like I'm really nervous the first time, and then I started to get used to it. How do you feel about the fact, how do you feel about the fact that, I'm assuming you have a lot of hearing friends as well, how do you feel about the fact that you have to go to therapies, speech therapy, implant appointments, audiology appointments, and your friends don't have to? Well, the way I look at it is uh, the change of your own personal introspection in a way, because it's like I have to put in extra effort to do that every million does every single day without even noticing it. So it's just like, okay, wow, but what? There's no, there's no point to be like down about it. So I just suck it up and do it. And it's also like you go to things and do it like this, and people are like, "Wow, I didn't even know that you were wearing hearing aids, or you have a cochlear because your speech so clear." 
And the only reason why that is is because I let it do all that. So it pays off. I assume you have a lot of hearing friends. How do you feel about the fact that you have to go to speech therapy and audiology appointments and implant appointments and they don't have to? Well, I want to be able to hear, so I just, I, You can quote Michael and yeah. say, suck it up. <laughs> uh, at school, in third grade, fourth grade, where I am now, I go to um, the hearing itinerary with him to do like practice things and stuff like that. If a person comes up to you who you don't know or who you've just met and says, what's that on your ear? How do you answer them? Oh, I love, I love when this happens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm a sarcastic person, so I kind of like play it off right away, but then I was just giving you a hard time. I just told me like, hey, this is a cochlear implant. Long story short, it does X, Y, and Z, so it helps me here. And then this is how I got it. And then they're like, oh, that's really cool. And then we always end up talking about something else. And you just, no, look at that. I just made a friend. Yeah. So I think it is the icebreaker in a way. <laughs> tell people that it's a cochlear implant what it is and explain to them that I can hear and stuff. And so it's pretty cool because they don't know what it is. If someone asks me um, what I have on my ear, I just say, um, these are called cochlear implants. I was born deaf and they helped me hear. <coughs> Did you ever get picked on because you have a hearing loss? Oh, yes. And of course, it's bound to happen, even though as much as you would like it not to happen. But honestly, that just kind of shapes you into the person you are today. And you just take little criticism. And you just like, you don't even know me, man. So, like, bullying, I feel bad for, for, uh, what's, what's his Caleb. Caleb, I feel bad for Caleb. Like, it's going to get tough, but just don't listen to him, to be honest. You just take out your hearing aids and be like, what was that? <laughs> 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 so you always got that option. But yeah, I wasn't too fucked of the bullying. Actually, like, bullying never got picked on, so I guess I was really lucky. But I don't know. All my friends understand what it is, and so they're really nice about it. So they, would, they usually would stand up for me if something would happen. Same thing as Ellie, I never really get picked on about my ears. It's probably because you have cool red implants. And blue on the other side? Wow. Do you have deaf and hearing friends? And if so, is there a difference between the two? Unfortunately to say, I only have hearing friends. I've just grown up in the hearing community all my life. But what I actually would think would be pretty cool to have a deaf friend and just go do things and at least have a, a deeper understanding of each other in a different way. But, you know, that will happen down the road eventually. I actually have both because I have deaf friends because I went to camp in Maine. With, what summer was that? About three years ago, four three years ago. And so I met a lot of friends with cochlear implants out there. So that was neat. And then I just recently went to Colorado and I met some cool friends there too. So there's a big difference between them because the deaf friends can understand, you know, what you go through and the hearing friends just can't really relate to it. When you think about having a hearing loss, if you call yourselves deaf or hard of hearing, or um, and you think about the hearing world, what could hearing people do for you? Um, well, they already actually do enough without even noticing it. Well, I was able to treat a 
it's like we're hearing people. It's all we always want. But uh, if there was like one thing we could ask for, it would be uh, it would be like don't talk so much with like food in your mouth so that I can reach your lips. <laughs> or keep your hands away from your mouth. <laughs> that would be it. Before you start, isn't that such a simple thing to ask? <laughs> Think of the whole hearing world, having a hearing loss. What could the hearing world do for you? Well, I think that people with cochlear implants can just do what hearing people can do, and I think that we're just as capable. And hearing people, they can help you. They can help you. Mm -hmm. I don't have an answer, so. All right. <laughs> Good one. How do you feel when you're not wearing your implant? Honestly, I feel like I'm in heaven. Absolute <laughs> silence. But uh, I don't know. I kind of look at it as like I get the best of both worlds. I get to hear and live in complete silence at the same time. So sleeping is a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Like he said, that the best of both worlds. And I always wear my cochlear implants because I like to hear. And the only time I ever take it off is when I get in the shower or I go to bed. But it's nice to not hear when you go to bed. <laughs> yeah, I take them off when I go to bed, swim, bath and stuff. So um, I really don't, when I'm sleeping, I don't hear anything. So that's Ellie and Caleb, you said you only really take your implants off to shower and go to bed. Are there any other times you really just take it off? Oh, most certainly when we're getting yelled at. <laughs> I was waiting to hear that. Yeah, or especially at school, it gets too loud in a classroom or something, or in the gymnasium, you know, it's, it's just overwhelming, but those are just simple tasks to turn them on and off. I asked in general about the hearing world, what could they do for you? What about teachers? What could they do for you? Well, what, what's it called? The IEPs these days. So we all we set up our accommodations. And I've only had like very few teachers where there's been like very seldom pro small problems, but they've been taking care of things to my mom, to be honest with you. I would just sit back and not do anything. But they actually already do a lot. They're, they're giving us knowledge, one. And then two, they usually, <coughs> the teachers I had usually go out of their way to make sure that I'm receiving the proper notes or if I'm picking up anything that I missed to make sure that I'm on the right track. So they already do go above and beyond and I appreciate it a lot. And it's like, I wouldn't be where I am in school without them. My teachers, like, they do anything to help me and they make sure I understand stuff. And they go out of their way <coughs> to, and I have an IEP too. And so that's nice because they know what to expect. Well, the way the teachers help me is I have an FM system, so, like, I can hear them when I'm in the So, that's all. Good. Do you feel part of the IEP team? And you're a little bit older. Do you feel like you should have been more a part of the IEP team? Well, I actually went to all the meetings. But then when I got to high school, that's when I, uh, I was forcefully put on the big boy pants and take control of what I want to be done in the classroom or what accommodations I want. So I guess I was literally part of each single step along the way. Mm -hmm. So that's it. early intervention no, to the middle school. Only until like high school. Once he hits high school, he has to become an active part. And by the time he reached his senior IEP, it was mainly, I one, he was 18. Um, but it was like, I they treated me as if I wasn't even in the room. Because they need to deal with him as an adult. He's going in and he needs to advocate. And there was a part in that meeting where I had an aha moment where they had said something and I went to open my mouth and Michael's like, no, this isn't about you, it's about me. It's, you know, I can answer this, I got this. And then that was just my point, just like, I'm not ready to come to <laughs> <laughs> But um, 
Yes, yeah, so at Family High School, they, they involve him in every step of the way. I go to the, all the IEP meetings because they want us to be involved so I can understand what they're doing to help me. And I'm in mainstream and straight A's, so it's, it's nice. Uh, Caleb's in fourth grade this year and we discussed starting next year he wants to start coming to his IEP meetings um, he knows all about them he knows what we're talking about when we're in there he knows what he gets out of them and what they provide to him but um, I, I think come fifth grade for where he is on his maturity level I think it would be a good time for him to start coming even if he doesn't have anything new to contribute just to be able to see what it's like that we're all sitting there talking about him so it would be, I think, beneficial for him to be able to be a part of that, too. And I think he wants to. Did you have a favorite teacher in school? Uh, yeah, um, I would have to say it was my uh, science teacher uh, in high school, Mr. James. Why? Why? Because uh, he really didn't treat me any different than anybody else, to be honest with you. He, he had no... Uh, no exception to any excuses why we would be slacking in school regardless if I didn't pick up the information or not. Yeah, it's a little bit of tough love, but how do you think it's going to be in the real world? <laughs> yeah. Probably my biology teacher, Mr. Woolers. He's awesome. And like he said, that he doesn't treat me like any other different, you know. And so he helps me if I ever get stuck. I think my favorite teacher would probably be first grade homeroom teacher, Miss Emerson, um, because she's really nice. <laughs> Is there a deaf adult or a deaf person who you look up to or admire? Um, a deaf, uh, unfortunately I have to say no to that one. I've yet to meet someone like that. I would say no to that. I mean, your mom. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. Any person you look up to? Oh, God. Uh, I kind of really don't want to single out anybody. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or, like, if I had to choose, I would, I would still pick two, and that would be my parents, regardless of the circumstances. Um, I would say my parents for sure, because, uh, well, A, they were, uh, they, um, what's it called? They had to take me everywhere, so they were basically by my side and everything. And they try to relate or understand as much as they can, and I give them uh, credit to it a lot, even though I kind of go through some really random mood swings, <laughs> some frustration with the with the hearing and all that. But that, that's what just happens. So I'll definitely stay with my parents. For the parents. I look up to my mom and my dad because they, you know, help me to do everything, and they take me to all my sports and they're always there. They're always on time for everything. So it's nice to do it again. Well, I look up to mostly everybody knows about my implants. You know, it's helping them. Before we open it up to the floor, parents, do you want to say anything? Carrie, you want to start? No, I think you guys did do a great job raising your kids. These you guys did really, you. really well answering the questions. Nice job. All right, any questions from the floor? Yeah, if you let's do it this way. Why don't you go ahead and stand up? Um, I will actually, if you don't mind coming up because we are videotaping. If anybody doesn't want to be on camera, you can, um, I guess, tell me and I'll say it into the mic. I guess we'll do it that way. Come on, Dan. We'll talk in your stuff.
I'm a DTH. Uh, my name is Dan Roach, and I want Mike to speak about uh, two experiences he met with families. Had a little child, uh, and the parents were considering a cochlear implant. He did a great job. I was hoping you could uh, speak about those two oh, situations. Ramon, right? What was that his name? Ramon, Ramon and Habib. Ramon. Habib, all right. And talk about when you threw your implant at Ramon's grandmother. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was fun. Okay, so uh, Mr. Roach and I and my mom, we went into the uh, inner city and talked to a somewhat fortunate family. And they're a little guy, a Ramon. Cutest little thing ever. If you guys don't follow soccer and all, if you uh, know soccer player, Lionel Messi, just looks just like him, but the baby version. Um, uh, Hispanic family spoke very little English, but it's all good being a translator. Um, I would have to say it was the coolest experience of my life. Just like open arms or welcoming into their homes so I can answer their questions about their concerns and fears. So it was pretty awesome knowing that uh, I can calm them down in a way. But uh, the, the incident about the throwing the cochlear at the, uh, the grandma, that was kind of funny. They were asking like, well, what does it look like? Well, blah, 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 how does it work? And I was just like, you know what, here, look at it, play with it. And I'm like, I got another one, don't worry. <laughs> but, yeah. It's expensive. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was a pretty awesome time. I enjoyed it. And then the uh, Habib, right, the uh, Arabic family, right down the street from my house, actually, I was surprised. I was like, wow, I should reach out to my community more often. So uh, we went over to their house, same incident. They uh, very religious family. I liked it a lot, actually. Um, like the father was talking about some incident where he had a dream about uh, he actually woke up deaf and his son, whose staff was actually talking to him and calling him something. He was like, this is really funny. But then it's uh, just like answer the questions about the fear, or like, will it hurt their child? To be like, honestly, no, it won't hurt their child, but it's, it's a risk that you have to take, because like, I know there's the percentages of something of like, the mitros don't connect, but it's a risk you gotta take in order to succeed. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's neat, you're going out there and you're a role model now. Very cool. Thank you. Other questions? Come on up. I am totally impressed with all three of you. For sure. So impressed. Anyway, I'm just nosy. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I'm a college student. I still don't even know what I want to be. <laughs> uh, I've been always tossing up in between the line of like going out through the role model way, taking some sort of speech classes, or being good at English in a way. Or I've always been a hands-on type of guy, do some mechanical engineering, but who knows? I want to go into the medical field, and I really, really want to be a doctor, but I would like to work in the outpatient uh, nursing. I know a deaf doctor actually. I know a deaf doctor. Next time she's in town, I'll let you know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know a deaf chemist. But when I find one. <laughs> Other questions? Don't be shy. Come on up. Um, how often does your cochlear implant fail, and if it does, what do you do? Uh, fail as in like run out of batteries or... Or just like not work? Uh, I've yet to have a problem with it not working at all. Fingers crossed, actually. But no, I haven't yet to have a problem. Um, well, it's a one percent chance that your internal piece failed, and so I haven't had that, so hopefully I won't, but my mom had the oldest processor inside the head, and so it failed last year. Last April year. last year. And so that wasn't fun, so she had to have surgery again. So she's had three times surgeries. Oh. So, so hopefully I won't, <laughs> mine won't fail, because mine's the oldest too. Has your processor or your implant ever not worked? Um, 
Well, besides running out of batteries, it's fine. Do you carry your own batteries or does your mom? <laughs> Mike, do you carry your own batteries or does your mom? <laughs> carry you carry his batteries too? I got batteries. Other questions? Come on up. I'm just curious about what kind of services you've gotten at school. I know Caleb mentioned hearing attendant services, um, but I'm curious like what kind of services you got? Were they different when you were younger compared to older? And um, how you felt about them? Because you know sometimes with itinerant services you're being pulled out of the classroom and just kind of how you felt about the different services you got at school too growing up. Um, I wouldn't even know what to call my services that I had throughout uh, elementary, middle school, and high school. But uh, elementary, I remember having to do speech, so that was always enjoyable. Um, and then, uh, and then what? Uh, my Miss Claire. She's a hearing itinerant. Yeah, I had a hearing itinerant as well. Um, did you have a note taker? No. No. Never had one, but uh, I did. I used to have a, uh, a like a big, huge amplifier in my room that I would just give a microphone to the teacher. That was what I had till like the FM came about, and then I really never used the FM. But then I went to high school and just sat in class where the teachers lives. And I was pretty independent, to be honest. Yeah. I used to do like a thousand minutes of speech therapy. Ellie sits. She was three years old. Was a thousand minutes of services a week. That's just been reduced recently, but um, I fully believe that that is a reason for her success as a student and the teachers. They say it takes a village to raise a child, and I believe that fully. Um, she had an interpreter starting at second grade, so that we did total communication with her. We never signed at home, but at school, we felt like she was missing. Um, some of the stuff and so therefore we wanted to ensure that she was getting all the information that was possible. She recently this year advocated for herself and um, went to her uh, coordinator and said that she no longer felt like she needed the interpreter because she was high honor roll. So um, they reduced the interpreter services uh, to four hours a day versus eight and then um, in January of this year she asked to reconvene the IEP meeting and um, we met again and they just missed her interpreter and everybody cried during that meeting because i mean they said she has you know she has the wings and that she needs to fly and uh, her grades actually are like 100 percent in all the classes um so it's been it's been pretty amazing she does do a hearing and face center and then she also um has had lip reading um since i mean since she was three or, or before that and so i think that skills has been really necessary but yeah it's uh it's been, it was quite amazing for me because I finally, she's been going to her IEP meeting since she was in, I wanna say it was seventh grade, I suppose, but she really advocates for herself. So as a mother with cochlear implants, it's difficult for me to not say, hey, this is what I feel like we need to be doing. I mean, she's very firm um, in what she wants. And so it's, it's been pretty cool to see that whole process. And you know, she's gonna be leaving in two years. So she, she has to learn how to do that, much like uh, Michael's mother indicated. Are you, other than your mother, is there anyone else in your family with hearing loss? There's not, no. You're the only one with hearing loss? Caleb, you're the only one with hearing loss? Come on up. Oh, I'm sorry, Caleb, you wanna answer? Oh, you want about oh. services, yes. Uh, same for Caleb, he started out in um, pre-K with speech and hearing itinerant services um, after going through early intervention and having all the in-home services. Uh, he hasn't had or, or I guess needed speech therapy since um, first grade uh, was when we finished that out at the end of that school year. He still receives hearing itinerant services, 30 minute pull out once a week. Um, that's how he could tell you that he has a sensory neural hearing loss. I didn't teach him that. That's what they work on. Um, just those things to really help him be able to advocate for himself and, and teach him more about um, his hearing loss and just hearing loss in general, I guess. So. Um, I 
I'm with a family that is uh, has a 22 month old who has a bilateral hearing loss and he just got a cochlear implant. He's had it for almost a year so we're kind of in the thick of his hearing and speech development so this might be for your parents unless you're a member but what was the timeline like when, with speech and hearing development um, and what were your experiences during those first few months or first few years after implantation? Uh, after implantation, mm -hmm. uh, well, I had mine when I was in high school, so like, I really wouldn't know how to answer that question. Um, yeah. Mine started with speech when he was <coughs> Actually, I found it a lot easier for me to learn after having hearing aids for all my life with the acoustic sounds. It's like, I found it easier to make a correlation between an acoustic note and an electronic note. It's like, this is that, match this. So it's just like making one huge puzzle for the sound. <laughs> as the great Nancy Scott said. <laughs> you just always let them, you know, get as much speech if they're able to get speech and get those sounds, but let them get as much as they can and just practice with them all the time. You had a follow up to your question? Yeah. Just like what did their speech development look like? Like when did you start seeing them putting together words, putting together phrases, maybe as what uh, a clearer oh. idea of uh, our our experience with Caleb, his first implant was at sixteen months. So born with profound loss, so he had nothing, no um, hearing at all, even with the hearing aids. Uh, then his second implant was at 22 months, and it was once that second one was activated when he actually, what they considered produced his first word. Um, he has a babbling and that kind of thing going on. But uh, he was also born extremely premature, so that was a factor for him as well. Um, his age didn't quite follow be in development. Um, I, I would like to follow up on that question. I think that uh, you have time on your side and technology has improved tremendously, especially in the last seven years. Uh, with Ellie, she was one of the second youngest, she was the second youngest child to get implanted. Um, she got implanted at 18 months old, did not say her first word until she was four, and that was with intensive speech therapy and did not speak her first complete sentence until she was almost uh, six and a half. It was a very, very long road, and it did not happen overnight. Now, I see, I am the founder of the Cochlear Implant Awareness Foundation, so I talk to a lot of parents, and I see that um, with students like Caleb, children like Caleb, like he is amazing to look at him and to hear his speech mm -hmm. and to hear what his mom is doing, and I think that is the technology. I mean, obviously what they're doing at home and the speech therapist, but I think the technology has tremendously improved, so I think that your child will have even greater strides and see, you know, uh, I don't know, more advantages than maybe we did um, in a shorter period of time. Is what, it, was, it was long. I mean, for us, it did not. It was very, and it was, um, 
you know, I, I knew it would never happen overnight, but as a parent, you want it to happen overnight. You know, you have really high expectations for your child. And so it, it's been a really long road for us. So it's amazing, like when I see how little Caleb is and, and how well he does, and it's just, it's mind blowing. It's, it's, there's a solid comment. It's hard because we go to therapy and they say that he's not progressing as a normal child would with a hearing, with an implant. A normal child would with an implant, it's kind of weird. But um, to hear that, it makes, I don't know, I guess it sets you at ease a little bit more because it could just take a little longer and just can't be rushed. So thank you. Yeah, you can't fit every child into one mold right. and every child is normal. Yeah, I was going to say, it's when it comes yeah. to like, like, there's no such thing as a normal. I know, words are hard. More questions? Yeah. Um, do you guys take like a special care kit or do anything special when you have, when you go to a new class, like when you're going to be around new people? No, I just go, just, just do it basically. I give motto, but uh, it's just I just look at it as a new class. So it's just like what's uh, what's what's to be new and what's to be found. What was that exact question? Do you want to explain? Do you it? have like a care kit that you take to your classroom? So like if you're hearing, if you're hearing, if your cochlears die during class, oh, so that you're yeah. Young. I like carrying my batteries in my purse or something because. They die every four hours, so I kind of need them, and so, yeah, I would just carry the bags. No, Caleb doesn't take anything with him. <laughs> His teachers probably help out with batteries charging, all of that. His teachers are probably helping him. Um, so far... His ba his batteries will last him all day, um, so it hasn't been that part hasn't been an issue. Although, you know, <coughs> mom's been guilty of not realizing that the charger wasn't plugged in the night before and thought they were charging all night, and we'll have batteries die in the middle of the day at the fairgrounds or something. But as far as school experiences, um, he hasn't we haven't quite gotten to the position where he's needed to to really have anything with him. Other questions? Yeah. So, so I'm a special ed teacher at Andrew High School where Mike attended uh, high school. I don't have Mike at all. I work most. I don't work with the deaf, hard of hearing population at all. Um, but something that Mike's not talked about that when I first started to learn about Mike, I asked a soccer coach about him. And he said Ehlers is an animal. And so I think Mike is not giving his full story as to his involvement in sports. Um, and he was so well regarded with this sport. So I don't know if he's being shy or what, but you definitely have to speak about that. And I think. All right, Paul. Uh, yeah, I haven't been really 100% honest about that aspect. So uh, I used to be a uh, really elite soccer player at uh, national ring teams and all that much stuff. I was a kicker in my high school, and I played soccer at the same time in the same season. Kicker for the football. Yeah. Yeah. Kicker for football and all that fun stuff. But uh, yeah, I uh, like I don't know where you really want me to go with this story. Do you want me to talk about the surgeries? Um, well, hey, I, I think it's important to know that you were fully, you know, you had, you know, you had hearing aids and you still participated in sports. All right. And you got implants. You still participated. All right. I understand where I should go with this question. Um, so sports to me were like. Um, I guess I would say the void of being fulfilled between the deaf and the, and the hearing. Like, that was, a, to me, that was the closest I felt normal. But, uh, well, since it's college, we gotta move on. We always can always live through our childhood dreams of being professional soccer players or football players. But, like, I'm surprised you didn't say you wanted to be a spaceman or something. Um, yeah. So like soccer was, I guess it was just my way of defining myself as normal, even though that's never possible, but it's just the way I look at it. Okay. We have time for one more question. All right. 
I'd like us to one more time give a round of applause to the parents because they've really raised amazing kids. And a definite standing ovation and applause to the kids. <laughs>